morning and welcome to the 60th Learn with Lorna this morning. I'm just going to wait uh, to see some people uh, join us, but who have we who have we got out there already? So welcome to uh, this week's Learn with Lorna. As I say, it's the 60th, which seems quite extraordinary, but uh, what doesn't seem extraordinary about the world in the last few uh, months and years? Um, welcome if you are new to the series uh, to uh, Learn with Lorna and welcome to the services of the Highland Archive Service. If you are new and you, you don't know uh, about the Highland Archive Service, we have four uh, archive centres across the Highlands. We have the Highland Archive Centre in Inverness, uh, Nucleus, the Nuclear and Caithness Archives in Wick, Lochaber Archive Centre in Fort William, and the Sky and Lochalsh Archive Centre in Portree. Uh, good morning, everyone. Everyone saying hello really quickly. Most people having rain. Yeah, it's pretty grim here as well. <laughs> um, so this series, as you will know if you've watched before, is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events but if you are able to donate towards our work then as I've said previously we're really really grateful for that so thank you very very much if you've been in a position to be able to do that. Um, a couple of quick things before I go on to this week's talk. Uh, thank you to those of you who have filled out the survey if you haven't yet done so there's a link within the body of the text of this film so if you could do that I would really appreciate it. It'll be closing on the 31st of May. So far I've got uh, 114 responses so I'm really grateful for that. A reminder as well that if you want to go back and watch previous episodes you can do that on YouTube so please do go and have a look for the High Life Island YouTube channel. And a final thing, um, I'm, I, I may be incorrect in this but it, it seems to me like there's been a slight change in uh, the way the film is going out and the way the circulation is happening of the film. So. Um, if you are able to uh, like the upcoming events, share them, uh, that would be really appreciated so that uh, we can continue to hit the audience who want to know about our collections. That would be uh, really wonderful if we're able to do that. OK, so this week I'm continuing this month's theme of business and industry records. And we're going this week to look at Sky's diatomite industry. So you remember, may remember last week when I looked at the aluminium industry that we started with a, a description of what aluminium is and how it's produced. Uh, and so I'm going to do the same this week because my guess is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my guess is fewer people may know about diatomite than know about uh, aluminium. So by all means, if you know about it, do do comment. Um, it may help if I say that it was known locally in Sky as calc, which as you know, I'm not a native Gaelic speaker, so apologies if I've got my pronunciation wrong there, but uh, which is for the Gaelic for chalk. But I thought the best thing to do would be to read you a description of uh, what diatomite is from the Industrial Minerals Association of North America website. Let's go straight to the experts before we uh, look at what I can tell you about it from our collections. OK, so their description reads, Diatomite, also known as diatomaceous earth, is a naturally occurring fossilised remains of diatoms. Diatoms are single-celled aquatic algae. It is a, uh, diatomite is a near pure sedimentary deposit consisting almost entirely of silica. The Greeks first used diatomite over 2,000 years ago in pottery and brick production. There are many diatomite deposits throughout the world, but those of high purity, which are commercially viable, are rare. The properties which make diatomite valuable include low density, high porosity, high surface area, abrasiveness, insulating properties, inertness, absorb absorptive capacity, brightness and high silica content. Diatomite has a wide variety of uses and is a component in hundreds of products and vital to the manufacturing process of thousands more. OK, so basically this is a sedimentary rock, uh, a mineral similar uh, in, in com composition to chalk, crumbly, naturally occurring. <clears throat> And some key things in there used in the production uh, and used in hundreds of products, but used in the creation and manufacture of thousands more products. What I found really extraordinary when I was looking at this, because I'm not going to lie to you, I don't know everything about all our collections. So uh, some of them take a little bit more uh, research than others. And when I 
went to look at our diatomite collections, I was absolutely mind blown by the range of uses diatomite has. So everything from um, drinks, cosmetics, paints, explosives, paper production, syrup uh, refining, soap manufacture, abrasives, fillers, filters, literally I can't, I think you'd be struggling to think of a thing that it can't be used for. The other um, key thing that comes out of that extract uh, from that website is the fact that the deposits that are both high, high purity and also, also commercially viable are rare to find. Now that quote mentioned that it had been used by the ancient uh, by the Greeks 2000 years ago in the production of pottery and brick. So where does Skye come into that story and how does Skye come to have a diatomite industry? Well, in the mid 1800s, diatomite was suggested as a component for dynamite. So Alfred Nobel, who of course you'll know from the Nobel Prize and for being the creator of, of dynamite, he had discovered that if you mixed uh, liquid, liquid nitroglycerine with diatomite, then it would produce a paste or a putty kind of texture. So you can picture the, the texture, I mean, and that would enable um, the explosive effect to be more easily controlled and to be used in certain circumstances. And so that in the mid 1800s, all of that raised the profile of diatomite as a, as a mineral and interest in where it could be found or produced. By 1873, uh, Nobel had established uh, a, a dynamite factory in Ayrshire as well, so within the country there was a uh, growing awareness of the potential of this mineral. And then in 1886, diatomite was discovered at several uh, sites in the Isle of Skye, notably uh, Monkstat, Loch Snysdale, Dunmore, but most notably at Loch Quicker. Now the Glasgow Herald uh, from the 28th of April 1886 recorded that the deposits had been Remarkable in both quality and quantity, with the deposit at Loch Quicker described as unequalled for the manufacture of silicates and ultramarine paints, dynamite glass, pottery, glazes, and it goes on to say, in short, the purposes for which it is adapted are numerous and, lit and likely to increase, while its purity and freedom from sand at this particular site is analysed as being most remarkable. And so Professor McAdam, who was a lecturer in chemistry and a consulting analytical chemist, chemist at a Surgeons Hall in Edinburgh, he was one of those who was involved in the early sampling of the sky diatomite uh, deposits. And he wrote a report about what he'd found there. And we hold a copy of that report. And it includes the glowing words. If you were, if you were ever um, commissioning a report, this is exactly what you would want somebody to write. I can confidently recommend this deposit as of first class quality and of mere, uh, and as more pure and free from noxious ingredients than any other deposit I have ever analysed from any part of the world. So you could see straight away that they're seeing the potential in obviously what this product can do, but also in the fact that this uh, deposit in Sky seems to be of such high quality. That Glasgow Herald uh, article reporting the discovery notes the belief that this is particularly due to the quality of the fresh spring water feeding the loch. And that's something we've touched on looking at landscape in the Highlands before of that quality of air and water. And there was also a belief then in those early days that the deposits would yield in excess of 100,000 tonnes of diatomite. And that article finishes with the words, it is to be hoped that the working of these deposits will be taken up which will be much to the advantage of the districts concerned, as well as to the industries throughout the kingdom. And so, um, the the consultant who had uh, the correspondent who had expressed a wish that the, the uh, deposits would be worked, his his wish was uh, fulfilled. And so, one of the collections we hold in our Sky and Loch Alsh Archive Centre <coughs> is the Macdonald and Viewfield collection. This is. Uh, similar to some of the other big collections I've talked about before, it's one of those ones which is a family and estate collection and therefore covers family, estate, business, organisations, local industry, all sorts of um, wide ranging subjects. The collection dates from 1736 through to 2003, it covers seven linear metres, its catalogue alone is 175 pages long, so that gives you an idea of the, the scale of that particular collection. But within that Viewfield, uh, McDonald of Viewfield collection are the papers of the Sky Diatomite Company. And the reason for that is that the company was founded uh, by three members of the McDonald of Viewfield family, Alexander, John and Harry, in July 1886. 
the whole collection is really fascinating, but this uh, collection to do with the sky diatomite is, is also particularly interesting. So it holds the records of the Sky Diatomite Company, reflecting the story of the industry on the highlands, uh, on, on the uh, in the island. Everything from correspondence and accounts, receipts, wage bills, uh, plans, drawings, promotional material. Uh, if you go back and have a look at the the kind of advert for today's event, you'll see a can of uh, car cleaner made of Highland Diatomite, um, and you'll see that on there. So the company was formed in 1886. And another thing that you'll be familiar with me we, talking about that I find so bizarre is what was happening concurrently. So if you remember when I talked about uh, the Crofters and uh, the, the Crofters and the uh, Crofting Commission, the Napier Report, all of that's happening at the same time. So we're only a couple of years after the Battle of the Breeze uh, in Skye. This is the same year that this company was formed as the Crofting, Crofters Holding Act was passed. And actually there's a document held uh, in our in Nucleus, in the Nuclear and Caithness archives, that talks about the potential of this industry to give alternative or additional uh, employment to young crofters. So again, that, that idea of overlapping history, that no event stands in isolation, every event is happening concurrently with all sorts of other things um, interacting together. So. Uh, Sky Diatomite Company was established in 1886 and an extract from the Scotsman from June 87 the following year describes the work being undertaken at the Loch Quaker site by about 40 to 50 men. And so I'll read you this extract from the Scotsman that gives an idea of what was the, the actual production process of extracting diatomite. <coughs> the Loch Quaker Diatomite Works. These works on the Kilmure estate, Sky, continue to make satisfactory progress. The company was formed about a year ago and active operations were begun in February last. Since then, a force of men carrying from 15 to 50, varying from 15 to 50, has been steadily employed. The loch, the bed of which is quite level and covered with marshy reeds, has been successfully drained by the formation of a cutting 300 yards long, 12 feet wide at the top and from 12 to 18 feet deep. Two smaller cuttings have been carried partly round the loch and a pretty large drain reaches through the centre. The bed of the loch is now fairly dry. The cost of drainage has been about £2,000. A supply of peat has been cut for kiln drying during the winter season. Twelve wooden drying sheds have been erected and others are in the course of erection. The sheds are 25 feet long by 3 feet 6 inches broad, open at the sides, with five drying pans in each one, one above the other. Two semicircular iron stores, 25 feet long by 18 feet broad, with a radius from side to side of 28 feet, are likewise nearly finished. Two similar stores, 50 feet long by 18 feet broad, are being put up down by the seaside. <clears throat> the stores are constructed of galvanised corrugated iron. So it gives you an idea of the, the buildings that are being put up around the, the site of the loch. It's needing to be drained so that they can access the diatomite and then putting up these, sh these buildings and sheds uh, going round to, to dry the, the diatomite once it's come out because of course it's been lifted from the water, it's uh, got a soggy consistency. It goes on to say, the diatomite which lies about 18 inches below the surface and extends downwards to a depth of 25 feet is cut with an ordinary peat spade in blocks of about 10 inches long by three broad. It, it is taken on hand barrows to the drying sheds where it is left to dry. It is then put into the stores. When cut, it has a greenish appearance and is pretty heavy. After being dried, the colour changes to white and the weight is very much decreased. During the bright sunshine of the last weeks, the drying sheds, with their shelves all filled with blocks of pure white diatomite, situated amidst the wide moors, form an exceedingly pretty spectacle. Until such time as a permanent road is constructed eh, from the seaside to the works, the diatomite will be conveyed on horseback to the shipping place at a cost of about 15 shillings per tonne. A visit to the works now in progress readily convinces one of the almost inexhaustible supply of pure diatomite there and of the great importance of this new industry to this portion of sky. So you can see there that that article gives uh, some of the gives you a visual image of what the site looked like and also the process of cutting uh, the diatomite, lifting it, drying it and then transporting it. Also a sense of how important it, they felt this was going to be to the industry of sky, employment rates and so on. 
but you also get a mention in there of the difficulties of transporting the diatomite across land without a permanent road. Um, and you may remember last week when we looked at the aluminium industry, that same challenge of getting the aluminium once both the raw content but also the, the finished product, transporting it across areas that weren't built, uh, weren't, you know, weren't used to uh, industry and uh, heavy industry. So within a few years uh, on this site, and I'm seeing Ryan, your comment uh, coming up, so um, you'll know a little bit about this. Within a few years, work had begun to construct a, tra a tramway or a narrow gauge railway from the loch down to the seashore. And the route was about two and a quarter miles long, uh, and it was called the Lilt Valley Diatomite Railway because it went along the course of the River Lilt. It was initially powered by gravity and manpower, so it would uh, naturally go one way and then be pulled, hauled back the other way. But later on, it had a small steam locomotive attached to it as well. <clears throat> And the railway line ran between Loch Weaker, where the diatomite was being extracted and air dried, down to Invertote at the coast. And that site, um, which is the one that uh, your comments are coming up about, um, has warehouses at the top of the cliff and then at the bottom had a factory to kiln dry and grind the diatomite. And if you, when we come off this, if you go in and have a look in, in Google, uh, you'll see some, you can find some pictures of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the ruins of those railway lines can still be seen and the ruins of the factories and the warehouses uh, can still be seen. If you are in the area or able to get to the area, if you have a look on the fantastic Walk Highlands um, website, which is something I recommend, recommend an awful lot, and um, there's a walk there that describes uh, the, the journey and you can see those, those buildings in the pictures as well. And then from there, from Invertote, the dried diatomite was loaded onto boats in the Sound of Rassi to be sent off onto the end users. I'm going to pause for a second to uh, remind you that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of talks. Um, but as I, as I always say, if you're able to donate towards our work, then we're really, really grateful for that. So thank you. OK, so we've got the diatomite to the point that it's that it's uh, leaving Sky and going on to the end users. So who are the end users? I mean, I've mentioned several times the incredibly wide range of uses for diatomite, everything from toothpaste to matches and paint and everything in between. Uh, and the Macdonald of Viewfield collection, which has the Sky Diatomite uh, Company records in it, includes all sorts of examples of people um, who were interested in purchasing and using the Sky Diatomite. So, for instance, there's a letter from 1895 uh, from Guinness and Sons uh, in Dublin requesting samples of the diatomite to use because they want to trial sky diatomite in their filtering process of making Guinness. Um, there's an 1894 uh, publication, a kind of promotional uh, piece of material, which includes a testimony from the River Valley Engine Works in Singapore. And I'll, I'll read you the advert. It says, diatomite is specially adaptable for the plugging or lining of music rooms, telephone rooms, billiard rooms, or anywhere where the inclusion of e or exclusion of sound is necessary. In ordinary house construction, ashes and other materials similar are commonly used as deafening the, between the floor and the ceiling of rooms. However, these do not serve very well for the purpose for which they are intended, viz. insulation of sound, and in addition they provide a suitable harbour for rats and mice. If diatomite is used, perfect de deafening of sound is obtained and freedom from all danger of vermin of any kind. There is likewise absolute fireproofing. The following is a testimonial which illustrates the use of diatomite as a protection from heat and sound. And so the testimony that's included in the advert is given by the River Valley Engine Works of Singapore. And it says, Dear Sirs, we have pleasure in stating that diatomite inserted between the corrugated iron and ceiling of St Matthew's Church has answered the purpose intended admirably. Although only laid one inch th thick, it has effectively prevented radiation of heat and deadened the sound of rain on the iron to such an extent that it is now almost unnoticeable. We consider diatomite eminently suitable for any similar purpose. So you start to see the, the, a, the range of uses, but also... Um, how they're advertising and promoting this. And there are also letters within that collection of people discussing the potential of buying diatomite for use in India, in Jamaica, in Demerara, Australia. Um, so really you get a sense of this huge potential of this product 
and um, all the people they're in conversation with about using it. Some other examples are the Yorkshire Steel and Engineering Works, Chubb and Sons, who you, you will know from producing locks and safes, Liverpool Building Material and Cement Company, the Manchester Fire Brigade, P&O, Peninsula and Orient, who write that they're considering trialling sky diatomite on their main boilers and their new steamer, which they are currently building at Greenock. So you really get a sense of this, the huge potential of this material, um, which can be have so many range of purposes. And also an insight from this collection into the cross working of all these companies at the same time. Documents from this period also um, also reveal the practicalities of running this industry. Yes, Christine, I agree. I think it's an amazing product, which is something I didn't know that much about when, when I came to look at it. I thought this is quite an extraordinary, versatile thing. Um, yes, documents from this time also talk about the practicalities of uh, running this diatomite industry. So things like there are receipts for the purchase of Hessian bags and cloths for transporting it some of which arrived entirely mouse-eaten and had to be sent back. Uh, quotes for shipping and distribution costs, advertising and testimonials, as we saw. Um, letters that talk about the purchase of equipment or offers to purchase equipment. Things like pulverizers, picks, barrows, pipes, um, turbines, weighing machines, things like that. So you really get a sense of the running of, uh, of the industry as well. However, one document uh, an 1897 letter from John MacDonald to his brother Alexander MacDonald gives an insight into something which was, um, which would go on and plague the industry, and also something that was touched on from the, in that very first extract from the American Minerals uh, website. John's letter wonders what the future will be of the diatomite industry, and notes the, d the difficulty he thinks they're going to have in ever making the product pay or making the business pay. So although there's all this huge potential of using it, the cost of, of producing it and extracting it and drying it is so um, burdensome that they're wondering if there is a, a profit to be made in the industry. Now, Alexander MacDonald died in 1899. Uh, interesting previous letters from within the collection refer to his ill health. There's there's letters saying we know we trust your health is improving. Um, but he went on to die in 1899 at a young age of, I think he was 59. Uh, and the company was, was sold on around that time to go and become the British Diatomite Company. And we hold copies of the advert for selling the company, including uh, in German newspapers, because Germany was the, the heart of the industry for uh, a, lo a long time. But there were huge difficulties in agreeing uh, the specifics of the sale. And this went on for months and months and months into uh, into several years. And so within the collection as well, that there is a representation of, of that uh, time period. So correspondence between interested parties, correspondence between solicitors, trying to nail down uh, the agreements of, of the business and, and the transfer of the business. So things like uh, information about shares, who is liable for expenses, what are the stock quantities and um, who holds responsibility for certain aspects of the business um, can be seen. And a quote which probably explains it best just says throughout this period the business was not on a regular footing. Um, and the whole period really was kind of blighted by some inexperienced management, um, problems with production and transportation, some financial difficulties and that predicted economic viability. Um, and and as you can imagine from that, that extract from the Scotsman talking about the challenges of extracting it, the, the diatomite, and then being able to transport it across moorland with no roads and things like that, you can see the, the references to the economic viability of it. But it's so frustrating when you know, you can see all the potential behind it. Um, and so production continued to a, a greater or lesser degree throughout the, the first decade or so of the 20th century. And there were some very um, uh, positive times for the organisation when uh, sky diatomite was used in dynamite in um, for mining in South Africa. So there was used in gold and diamond mines uh, and some other times where they faced particularly hard uh, competition for the business, particularly from Germany, as I mentioned, was uh, very heavily involved in the industry and also from America. And so I wanted to illustrate this by reading to you a, a document from 1896, a letter from John Waddell and Sons 
from uh, in East Greenwich and they are writing about the prices and how the prices will need to come down if they're going to continue to trade. So it says, um, Dear Sir, we duly received yours of the 28 volt uh, and regret that you cannot see your way to reducing the price of your diatomite at present. And we have just heard that Bell's contract has gone past us again. We note that you expect to be able to reduce the price at the end of this season and for our guidance in quoting for deliveries ahead, you might indicate to us what re reduction you expect to be able to make. We enclose you an offer we have had from one of the German firms and we are also sending you the samples they sent us to show you that people have, can and are selling the stuff at the price that we are paying you for it. You will notice from the samples that numbers one and two are lighter and superior to your sky diatomite and that even number three, which is the most alike to yours, is, if anything, better. So that's quite damning, um, but uh, a very clear indication that prices will need to come down if trade is going to continue. And so those, that kind of competition, the cost, uh, the prohibitive cost of producing, those and other factors meant that the production really ground to a halt just ahead of the First World War by which point it's estimated that about 2,000 tonnes had been excavated, uh, had been extracted, sorry. What I find really interesting in this is to note that the production didn't resume during the wars. So that's really interesting to me, despite the fact that there was a known potential for use in explosives. And also just in my experience of working with our collections, what I tend to see is that absolutely every possible resource will be mined and used to support the war effort. So I thought it was really interesting that they didn't um, do that during either the First or the Second World War. If you compare that to the aluminium industry that we talked about last week and how that production of that really ramped up very quickly to support the war effort. There was a brief uh, period in the late 1930s where some of the diatomite uh, deposits were leased to a, Germ uh, a Glasgow syndicate and they carried out a survey to see what the potential scale was of the remaining material at Loch Weaker. And they estimated that there was about um, 30,000 tonnes remaining, but they also noted the constant problems with flooding, uh, with the fact that when they drained the water to try and access the, the diatomite, it then very quickly flooded again. The isolation, uh, the, the problems of transporting the material across the moor and then the, potent, the, the problems sometimes of um, transporting it off the island as well. And so nothing else really happened until 1950 uh, when the excavation was restarted under the Scottish Diatomite, uh, under Scottish Diatomite Limited. By 1954-55 they had built a factory at uh, Uig, so processing happened there rather than at Invertote, and so the Invertote railway and factory were already falling into ruins by this point. And we hold um, a copy, a copies of interviews uh, with several of the people who worked in the diatomite extraction industry during the 50s, uh, the, the, this period of the, of the industry. And so I thought rather than me trying to reword them and tell you, I'm going to read a few extracts from those interviews so that you can hear their words about their experiences of working in the industry. So I'm going to start with ex-charge hand uh, Mr Donald McNabb and they asked him what exactly were the areas of activity for diatomite and what happened at each post and he said the actual mining took place at Lockweaker up by the township beyond the township of Lailt. To begin with in the 1950s we dried the diatomite down at Invertote but that was before the factory was established at Uig. There were three old black sheds by the main road at Invertote round Nissan huts one was a general purpose shed, another an office, and the biggest of the three had an electrical dryer which we used for breaking down and drying the diatomite. At that time none of it left the island from the shores of Invertote. Once it was dried we transported it to Uig and it left the island by boat. Later on when the factory was purpose built at Uig, during my time the, the electrical dryer was reinstated there and after drying it was refined there. And then he says, they also tell me there was diatomite mining elsewhere in that sky, but I don't know anything about that. They asked, did, did diatomite uh, contribute much to the economy of North Sky? Diatomite, diatomite was a godsend when it came. Not long after the war, men just couldn't get work, and the diatomite provided 50 or 60 men with work at its peak around 1955-56. When I would be going to the bank on Friday for the wages, which were £5 a week, I would be coming away with a few hundred pounds. It was big business and it was very welcome when it came. But he does say that he thinks the factory, it took a while to build 
and the factory at Oog is what spoilt the industry altogether. It was a mistake to build the factory so far from the loch, as it meant that we no longer dried the diatomite at Invertoat, so we had to take it all wet to Oog for drying, a journey of maybe 23 miles one way for every load. You might leave with five tonnes of wet diatomite, but the end product dry would only be the equivalent of one tonne, so the factory wasn't thought through properly and we wasted a lot of time and money on travelling. And they asked him what are the general working conditions like within the diatomite industry. And he says there were three shifts each day, each, each of eight hours. The diatomite went on 24 hours a day and six days a week. It was a dirty job, it rained a lot and you had your oil skins on all the time. If you were driving, that was a cleaner job, but if you were in the factory at Oog, that was terribly dusty. I remember one of the local doctors coming into the factory on one occasion and saying that we would all be dead in 10 years time. You did a good day's work and it was a job. If it was on the go today, there would be fewer people employed and better working conditions. But when I look back on it, I would say that I enjoyed it and I had many friends in it. So that's uh, that interesting take. And I, I, you know, I suspect he's right that if it was uh, if it was in production there today, the, the working conditions would be entirely different. Um, Another interview we hold was conducted by Dr Margaret Bennett of the School of Scottish Studies in 1995 and her interviewee was a Mr Murdo McLean and his feelings about the working environment are very similar. So Margaret Bennett had asked him what was the sort of atmosphere working in a place like that and Murdo McLean says it was well they put it to me it was hellish it wasn't fit for people to work in. Oh, the, d the dust. We had a wee mask with a wee filter on it, and that was all. You took it home, you took it to bed with you. You got hosed, there was a vacuum, and at the end of the shift you hosed yourself down and got the dust off you, but it was on your skin, it was in your nose, it was in your lungs. And they said, did any of the men complain of any respiratory or other ailments? Well, you see, you just don't know, he said. You see, work was scarce. It was the only work there was, and people were only too glad to have it. And I know as far as I'm concerned, it went for my chest. I was at the doctor, I got ill, I went to the doctor, and it was old Dr MacDonald, and he said to me, if you're going to carry on there, you're not going to last long. And I told him, it's work. And he said, I'm telling you. So a real, um, <clears throat> really interesting insight into the conditions, but also just that you know, the desperation of a post-war period of going, it's a job, and the doctor saying, you're going to die, and him saying, it is a job. Um, now, that revival, uh, as I say, started in 1950, but the revival of the 1950s really didn't return much to the investors at all. The costs, as always, as they had been from day one, the costs of extraction, of processing, of transportation, tended to always outweigh any profits that could be gained. And the factory finally closed in 1960. And although there were those comments from, from both of those interviewees about the, uh, the, their impact on their health and the lasting, benef uh, the lasting effect on their health, um, there are also comments within both of those about the, the community feeling and, and the friendships. And that loss to the Trotternish community was great, as we talked about last week with, with aluminium. Any, any industry that exists in a relatively small community and then suddenly folds has a huge impact. And there were around about 30 men, I think, employed at the time that the factory closed. And there's been no diatomite industry since. The closure, of course, was due to economic uh, pressures. Mr Kenyon, who was uh, from Scottish Diatomite, said at the time that they had lost £250,000 over 10 years and that they were no longer willing to input, invest any money into diatomite production. But I wanted to uh, finish by reading you an extract from that second interviewee, Murdo McLean, in which he retells the story of a curse that was believed to have been put on the industry by an old woman who'd been put out of her house to make way for the works in the early days. So this is what uh, they said. He, he talks about the fact that she had been forced to move out of her house, I think when they were laying the railway. So when they put her out of her house and she put a curse, what happened then? And he answers, the curse was that, her curse, now, and I only know what I've been told, but her curse was that it didn't matter what firm or what money was spent that it would never work, the diatomite would never work. They would go broke, whoever they were. 
So when Angus, this old man from Staffen, used to be on night shift, he says to me, it's not going to work. Be quiet, I said to him. All this new machinery, it's all the best they can get. I don't care, he says. It's not going to work. The curse is still on this place. It's not going to work here. So I who had him and the curse, and I said, it's impossible. I'm telling you, he said. And that's the history of what I told you. They got everything. There was thousands spent there and nothing went right. Even the puffer leaving the pier went wrong. And they maintained, these old people maintained that it was all for the curse of this woman. And so they sold the place for scrap and McBrain bought it over. And that's where the ter terminal of the Caledonian McBrain ferry is today. And that's that. And that's the diatomite. So, you know, I, I assume it's to do with the economic viability, but who knows, maybe the industry would never have lasted very long. Um, I hope you have come out of that knowing a little bit more about what diatomite is. I know certainly I came out of it knowing a lot more than I uh, went in knowing when I started researching for this one. So uh, I hope that that's been uh, of interest to you. As I say, um, thank you for uh, for joining me. Please do join me again next week. I'm looking next week at uh, Grover's and the history of Hamilton auction marts, um, Thurso and some other locations as well. Uh, so I hope you can join me for that next week. Uh, reminder, as always, um, that you can watch the films on YouTube if you want to go back. Um, please, I would encourage you again, if you're, if you're able to share uh, the films, the events that are upcoming, please do that um, because I, I'm unsure if there's been a, a slight change in the algorithms of this going out. I'm not sure. Um, but if you're able to, to, to share that with people, then I would really appreciate it. Um, and of course, a reminder, as always, that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered in, in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this. So thank you for joining me. I hope you can join me uh, next week. And I, yeah, I hope you can join me next week. I'll speak to you then. Bye.